Welcome back to the world of Ryan Knight. Welcome back to my channel. I usually say at the start of these things that I don't care about growing this channel, which I don't, but I think I'm like hitting my stride with this a little bit. I think I'm psychologically prepared for other people to start watching it. Uh, it took a while, it took like six months, but I, f I think I feel like I'm finally getting comfortable doing this and I prefer doing it this way to what I was doing when I first started the channel even though it's like way less popular and way less like the correct way to be a YouTuber but this actually makes sense to me I think though if I was gonna improve this what I would do is I would chop these things up into like the clips that they're about because it's really basically like a fucking I don't know like just format wise, like a like the Bill Maher show, like a like a talk show, kind of. It's just me talking to a camera, and uh, it's like a one man podcast kind of a thing. And I think that's conducive to having it chopped up into clips. You know, you have like Jerry clips or like Lex Friedman clips, Lex clips, or uh, other podcasts have like clips. Uh, but I don't know if I'm really gonna do that. I if if people start watching these then I'll probably do that I might do something else though I might like make it clear in the thumbnail that there are timestamps uh, because I think when people see like 45 minutes long they just they're like no I'm not dealing with 45 minutes but if I can create like a no no you can come in you just watch like seven minutes of it I'm just too lazy to cut it up into clips like here's what's on the menu for today it's like a bunch of seven minute clip things one to seven minutes anyway okay so uh topics for today cowboy bebop show which i was able to talk with like a couple people around town about um i watched the whole thing if you've been watching this channel you know that i love cowboy bebop it's one of my favorite things ever it feels really weird to like keep repeating that in every video but like who knows this is probably the first video you're watching if you're watching this um, and I was skeptical about this anime from the get-go because live-action anime is an ill-fated endeavor to begin with. It's never a good idea. Um, here's my thing about this show. I think in a nutshell, it's like a local theater production of Cowboy Bebop. And I think in that sense, it's fine. It's not like offensive to exist, but you have Cowboy Bebop, this thing that is a masterpiece of quality, uh, storytelling, originality, style, substance. Uh, its structure is interesting. Like even its structure is interesting. It's just like a masterwork of, uh, I was gonna say cinema, but anime. Uh, but I, I guess you could count that in cinema as well. It's, it's an incredibly uh, well done, well executed, well conceived thing. Uh, it's light. It's got. It's easy to get into. It's got interesting characters. Uh, it's got a lot of depth. It's got a little bit of like a philosophical side to it. It's got a shitload of style. It's got a lot of original. That's the original anime. Uh, Cowboy Bebop show is like. Um, it's like a CW show in terms of quality or like a Paramount Plus show. It's like the kind of show you would get on Paramount Plus, um, which has a very specific quality level. So in that way, it does feel like a local theater production of Cowboy Bebop. And also in that way, it feels like they made some twists on it. Uh, one, in some cases, for obvious budgetary reasons, uh, like narrowing down different sets and planets and all the traveling that the crew goes through in the anime. Um, but most of the changes, I'd say 90% of the changes were what I'm going to call like high school girl changes. <laughs> like, it's like, I've been using this term local theater production because I do think that's like the quality level to it. But in terms of like the script changes, it's like very high school production. It's very, like, there's an immaturity to it. Uh, like, they didn't understand the depth or the nuance or the humanity or, like, the what is beautiful 
about the original anime. And it's got very like, we're gonna remake Hamlet, but like, we're, we like high school musical, so it's gonna have a bunch of like high school musical shit in it. And uh, that's what Cowboy Bebop, the anime, feels like. It feels like they took something and they're like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna make, remake this like classic beloved thing, you know, we're gonna remake Hamlet, or we're gonna remake uh, Rent, or you know, some famous uh, piece of theater. Uh, but we're, <laughs> but get this, like, what if, what if Julia, instead of, uh, instead of being the object of, you know, Spike's destruction and affection, becomes a mob boss? What if Faye's a bisex? What if Faye's bisexual or a lesbian? It's unclear. What if, <laughs> what if Ed has full-blown autism, as we understand, like today in the real world? Uh, just so, like, the, their changes are very on the nose, very ill-conceived. Uh, the Grin one, in particular, is kind of weird. Like, not that this. Uh, guy is doing a bad job is grin like it's is a fine character like all this this show almost shouldn't be called cowboy boot like if it was called something else it'd probably be like a decent like cw like paramount plus show uh but it's because it's being compared to cowboy bebop which is like this absolute like masterpiece of a thing like grin's story in that anime it's a two episode arc he's like the central character of this whole thing uh and it's like it's very moving uh and uh he, there is, it, it does touch on trans issues and trans representation, uh, but it's not about that. He just sort of is that as a result of the things that happen in the plot. Um, but anyway, they, they took all this like storytelling and this like nuance and this like emotionally evocative, emotionally effective arc, and they boil it down. It, like it's like high school girl thinking. It's very like, yeah, like we're gonna have. I don't know. I don't. I don't even know. You know what I mean, right? You know what I mean. Like it feels like something like I don't know. A high school kid would come up with like these plot twists. It's it's very dumb, and uh, it's like yeah, it's it's like t trying to dis dissect uh, anything of that level. Like uh, maybe sit down for a second and think to yourself that just maybe you don't have the fucking chops to uh rewrite stairway to heaven you know what i mean like in that way i like that it feels like a high school production because it doesn't feel like they're trying to own it it feels like they're trying to do their version of it and there are some things that work uh in, but it's goofy as fuck it's really goofy um but there are, i i do feel like it's getting dog piled on way too hard like, if you look at the internet, you would think this thing was just an absolute piece of trash, and maybe you do feel that way, but I think it's a C minus, D plus, cusp between a D plus and a C minus, and I think that's fair, and I think that's, like, uh, objective. Like, there are things in this show that work. I think the casting is actually fine. Uh, I love the dude who plays Jet. He's nailing it. I don't like that they turned Jet into Barrett from Final Fantasy VII. That seems racist to me. Somewhat, like, ironically, that seems racist. Like, they tried to turn a character who was already, like, passably black and probably voiced by a black dude and tried to make him black by giving him, like, father, like, these, like, stereotype, like, black male community issues. Uh... They just turned him into Barrett from Final Fantasy VII. Like, doesn't that seem weird to anyone else? It seems a little, it seems a little racist to me. You know, not to not to throw out the R word, but uh, anyway, that dude does a great job. Uh, and uh, I thought John Cho actually did a pretty good job. He's obviously not the same Spike character, or like not exactly the same Spike character uh, from the show. I even thought Daniela Pineda, I think her name is. I think she did a good job, and she was hot in Jurassic World, and she's pretty hot in this. She's annoying as fuck, but. <laughs> but that's also the character, and I don't think they deviated too much from Faye in the anime. Like, they still maintain that it's an interesting character and not just your standard strong woman Ripley clone trope of a, you know, hollow shell of a paint-by-numbers character. Um, I thought there were, you know, some... how to put this? For the budget they had, the color palettes they were able to achieve and the, um, whoever the director of photography is, uh, I think did a good job, you know, given the budget they had. Because it, it basically feels like it has the budget of The Flash, 
like the later seasons of the Flash are probably a little bit lower than that. Uh, and they were still able able to achieve some like interesting uh, costume and set designs. I think that those things were largely very successful. Uh, the script is it's like a CW script, man. It's it's not horrible, but it's got some like fucking melodrama in there that is just so dumb. It's almost good again. Like uh, ah. Like, I don't know, like, like soap opera level shit. This whole, like, vicious thing is this soap opera. It's, it's almost, like, straight up, like, a telenovela, like, fucking soap opera. This whole vicious spike, uh, Julia, like, love triangle, as, as the, they set it up in the show. Um, so, I don't know, man. I actually would watch a season two of this with the understanding that it's this high school production of Cowboy Bebop kind of a thing. Like, I would watch another season of high school production Cowboy Bebop. We're trying our own thing. <laughs> don't judge us too bad. We don't have that much money, and we, th like, we think this is interesting, but maybe you guys don't, but we're making it anyway. I would watch another season of that show. I wouldn't watch another season of, like, I don't know. It's, it's, It's better than other live-action anime adaptations I've seen. It's actually watchable. I, I was able to watch it from start to finish and be interested. There are s Power Rangers. It's like the production quality of Power Rangers. Yeah, yeah. It's like Cowboy Bebop Power Rangers edition. Anyway, I think uh, people are just... They're, it's not a good show, but I think people are being overly mean to that show. Uh, and... Yeah, everyone's saying, you know, F, F minus is the worst, this absolute trash, abomination. And just the sheer number of people who want to get their, like, hits in. Like, that's, it's just classic internet dogpiling. Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit much. I think it's not a great show. It's, it's C minus, D plus. Uh, it's like, it's kind of trashy television. There are some good things about it. There's a lot of fucked up, stupid decisions about it. A lot of very, like, strange dialogue and character choices. Um, that are, like I said, feel like they came out of the mind of like, <laughs> I'm going to say high school girl, but I really mean like a kind of a dumb high school girl, because I could think of like some high school kids who could think of some way cooler shit than this probably. Um, like you could have changed some shit <laughs> and, and, made, and made something good. Like it, it's not destiny that you change shit and it becomes worse, right? You could have had some good ideas, but all your ideas were... <laughs> Your ideas were fucking dumb. They were like high school kid ideas. Anyway, uh, Cowboy Bebop, I would give it, uh, it, I think, objectively a D plus, but I enjoyed it at a C minus level. Okay, that's my final thing. I'm going to pause and restart it until my timer refreshes. All right. Okay, so I think uh, Cowboy Bebop is getting like too much criticism. It deserves criticism. It's not great. Um, on the other hand, I think Arcane, which I'm going to preface this by saying I think is very, very, very good, uh, is getting a little bit too much, it, like, it's getting a little too much praise. And it's not that the praise it's getting is um, hyperbolic or overly exaggerated. Which I think in some cases it is, like, oh, Arcane is like the best show ever made of all time. Um, I think just like there's also the volume of the praise, just like there's the volume of criticism for Cowboy Bebop. And in this instance, I think it goes the other way. I think the internet would lead you to believe right now because of sort of like the positive feedback loop uh, that this show is like an S tier show. Um, I think it's really good. I think it's a solid A. Uh, but I thought Squid Game was better. I don't think this show captures, like, how to put it, like, it, it hits pretty hard, um, it makes a pretty big splash, but not in the same way as, like, The Boys, or Breaking Bad, or, you know, um, Game of Thrones, or 
lost or you know any of these things that went like super duper uh cybersonic mainstream like squid game um so it's and those i think were s tier things obviously except you know game of thrones got pretty stupid at the end um but it is really good the animation okay i i think going into this it's got so much league of legends and riot games branding that it might scare away people who are like vaguely familiar with what those entities are but don't associate with them they don't play the game uh, they don't know the company whatever and um i was kind of worried on the other sense like i am familiar with league of legends i'm not like a huge league of legends guy i played dota like religiously in college uh, and then when league of legends went into beta i played their their beta their closed beta their open beta and then i played for like a year and then i switched back to dota 2 or when dota 2 came out there was like heroes of new earth i played that for a bit and then dota 2 came out and i went back to dota 2 and I played that until I got tired of being called the N-word by like 11 year olds. Uh, so at that point I switched to Heroes of the Storm where people are nicer. And that game just died and then I just kind of stopped playing games like that. But I still watch, uh, I still watch Dota matches on, on TV. So okay, that's my like level of familiarity with like League of Legends as a game. Also I used to pass by their like campus on my way to work every day for a year. And I knew like a fair, like a couple of people who worked there. Anyway. Um, So what I was nervous about is to me League of Legends is like just this hodgepodge of like character designs that are not really interconnected and kind of have nothing to do with each other. They were just things that seemed cool in kind of an isolated sort of a way and uh, just made to be like pieces in the game, like characters for the game. And I think at some point they decided, okay, we need to have like some sort of narrative framework under this thing, but the whole thing to me felt like just like fucking scaffolding. Like it didn't feel like uh, the characters were created out of like a legitimate um, like story that anyone was trying to tell. They were created out of like we need characters for this game. It's very like gameplay specific. And so I was worried like how does this translate into like an actual narrative thing, uh, this IP? Uh, which means intellectual property for those who aren't familiar with the industry terms. Um, and other things have failed, like Blizzard's World of Warcraft. Like, it, it doesn't penetrate, you know, to any other... Um, it's only good if you played the video game. It doesn't, like, it doesn't stand on its own two feet as being a, any good. Uh, and then there was, like, that Dota anime from before. Uh, which I didn't watch, uh, because same reason. It's it's like, who wants to know the backstory of, like, Mirana, right? It's, it's already, like, a knockoff of Tyrande from World, from World of Warcraft, right? Because it was originally a Warcraft 3 mod, and it was just a reskin of Tyrande's character. So, uh, what's, what's that about? But anyway, Arcane stands on its own. Uh, it's a very good show. Uh, the animation is very good. I think it's probably some of the best animation I've seen. Um, they have some really talented animators working on this thing. And I'm comparing it kind of to like uh, animations I watched recently. Love, Death, and Robots uh, was one of them. And um, oh, there was another one I saw recently. It was Star Wars Visions, that's right. Uh, Star Wars Visions. And um, kind of reminds me a little bit of the Dragon Prince. Uh, but I like that they went with their own style for it. Um, it's a, kind of an original style. It's not too anime. It's not too American. It kind of toes the line, which is very like Riot Games as a company. Very like, how to put it, like 60% 60, 60 American, 40% Asian. That's what that company feels like, just vibe-wise, or maybe like 70, 30. Um, and... Um, It feels, you guys aren't from this area, like, Riot Games is from where I'm from. It, it has, a, like, a vibe. Like, I'm from South Bay in California, like, originally, I live in Florida. Um, and this whole, like, Culver City, UCLA area, Santa Monica area, Sawtell, that whole area, has, like, a very specific kind of vibe. 
So I almost see Riot Games like a sports team. That's like a regional, like, that's like their, <laughs> that's that area of LA's like vibe. That's their like contender in the, uh, the international video game competition. Um, yeah, so the animation is really good. I actually really identified with the, um, who was supposed to be the bad guy. The guy who was like sort of uh, the villain and he was Jinx's daughter and he was just sort of like hyper rational sort of godfather type of character. I actually really liked both that character and Jinx's character and their relationship. Uh, I liked all of the characters. I liked Caitlyn. I liked the main character. Um, I guess she's not the main character, but I'm talking about Violet, or they call her Vi. Uh, but I, it, you see it spells off, and I kept thinking it's V. Uh, I even like the, the fucking president dude. Even though that dude, I when I meet people like that in real life, I'm old enough now that I can, like, uh, not be a dick about it. <laughs> but that's like the oil to my vinegar, like that type of person. The type of person who's that president in the arcane show. I just like, oh man, I just don't get along with that type of person. We see things completely oppositely. Yeah. Actually, I like the two the two other guys. I like the two the two dads. I don't know. The godfather dude and then the other dude who was like the good guy leader of the lower class people, the bar owner. They were like actual bad. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. There were some things I didn't like about it, but I can't totally put my finger on it. It's it's something to do with like Hmm. I really can't articulate it. It's something to do with like what feels like the overall maturity level of the thing. And I think for the most part, it feels mature. Like you can have something that's for all ages, like Harry Potter is for all ages. Um, but it still feels like it's, there's a maturity to it. And this had that maturity, but there's like a, maybe a couple of moments and I'm not articulating this well, well at all, because I don't mean it goes, it makes like stupid like kitty jokes or has like bad dialogue or whatever. Just like, like a, like a, it's being mature at some, in some places in the way when a kid acts like they are being mature, but that's not like actual maturity, you know what I mean? Like when a kid acts what they think it's like to be an adult, which is, I don't, I don't, I really am not articulating this very well. And it didn't happen that often. There was just a couple of times in the show where I just went like, hmm. <clears throat> like, like I'm like, I'm a little too like world weary for that to land for me. But I, I really liked the show. I really liked it. Uh, I'll watch a season two. I almost am curious, um, I almost think it would be interesting if they didn't focus on the same characters every season. If they, like, jumped around and if, if the next one was about, uh, I don't know, some other characters from the League of Legends universe, some other ragtag group that is um, bouncing around there. Okay, so comparing it to other things, I think it most reminds me lately of Shadow and Bone. And I think it reminds me of... Um, that other show? I literally had it in mind right before I started talking. It reminds me of Shadow and Bone and Castlevania. It reminds me of the Castlevania anime as well. I think it's better than Castlevania because it's the animation I think. It, well, mm, I don't know. Castlevania's animation is pretty goddamn good. Um, I do think it's overall like a bigger production than Castlevania. 
Um, and I do think that it's quite good. I don't know if I think it's better than Shadow and Bone, even though it's higher production quality than Shadow and Bone. Just because Shadow and Bone, to me, has... Maybe this is what I mean about the maturity. Shadow and Bone doesn't have to rely on tropes so much. Like, in, in Arcane, you still have, like, the tropes, like the crazy girl, Harley Quinn, Jinx's Harley Quinn trope. Um, like the, you know, the strong, you know, bully fighter trope, um, you know, the rich kid on the other side of the tracks trope, um, not that those things are like bad, but they're so ingrained in how video game stories typically work. This is interesting. This is interesting. Uh, okay. So one time I was listening to this guy's rationale for why he thought Final Fantasy VII had a better story than Final Fantasy VI. And he said uh, it was just an evolution of storytelling. He thought that, um, I don't know, some Redditor or something, he thought that in Final Fantasy VI, they were still thinking of the characters as a gameplay construct first. So Sabin is a monk. Now we have to create a character who is a monk, uh, or, you know, Terra is a mage. Now we have to write a character who is a mage. And in Final Fantasy VII, they had flipped it around entirely, and they thought, all right, so we have, you know, this character, and uh, we have Cloud, and we have Tifa, and we have th these, these characters. So what gameplay class could they conceivably fit into now that we've already, you know, created this universe? And... Um, League of Legends as a whole still feels like it has that work, like working backwards from gameplay concerns quality to it. Um, but I do think it's successful. I think they made a mainstream thing. And I think it's difficult to um, over-congratulate them for how difficult that is, given how many other places tried to do that and failed. Uh, World of Warcraft tried to do it, failed. Uh, Square Enix tried to do it. In fact, that's why they had to become Square Enix because they blew all their money on the spirits within. Anyway, they tried to like make like a mainstream like 3D animation movie. Fucking failed. Uh, so these things aren't traditionally successful. Um, and I think the way that they're maneuvering this IP is actually really interesting. And we're going to segue here um, into this next topic. Because it's interconnected and like now we're just talking about Riot Games sort of as a whole. Uh, but so I'm playing Ruined King as well. In fact, I'm like almost done with it. I think I just have to, I think I'm right at the final dungeon. I already got everyone's ultimate weapon. So I think I just got to, you know, do the little, you know, go through the last dungeon, beat the boss. Uh, my safe house is story like 97% completed or maybe 99%. Um, but the world is of like League of Legends is very like Pillars of Eternity 2. It's very like Jack Sparrow uh, kind of uh, colonialist era England. It's very like Carnival Row on Amazon Prime. And I think that's a good setting. Uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, East meets West in the sense that that's a very, this like Victorian era England sort of full metal jacket or full metal alchemist, um, or like Valkyria Chronicles setting is very popular. This like old school, like European kind of a thing. And that's vaguely what the setting for League of Legends is. Uh, and they're doing like this full court press to make this IP basically like a worthwhile IP. And I think that between this game Arcane, or I'm sorry, this game Ruined King, and this show Arcane, uh, I think that that is successful. I also think Valorant looks really good. Uh, I used to play Counter-Strike back in the day. I played Counter-Strike, I played Team Fortress 2, um, and I played a little bit of Overwatch, but people in Overwatch are dicks. Overwatch isn't a fun game. Team Fortress 2 is fucking fun. 
Um, Counter Strike is fun. Like Overwatch is. I quit playing Overwatch. Overwatch is not fun. Um, anyway, I don't really play those games anymore. But uh, Valorant reminds me a lot of like why Counter Strike is fun, and it has to do with like the how one to one like your movements feel, like how clean everything feels um it's just it just feels like a well-oiled machine of an fps just like everything's kind of like perfect uh and that's the like that crisp feeling it's obvious when you watch valorant like they they're going for that um but a lot of those games fail because it also reminds me of like like those shadow run shooter games and like who the fuck played those nobody right so it could go either way counter strike or like forgettable like shadow run uh, very similar gameplay twist to the Shadowrun games. So I think Riot as a whole is doing pretty well. I think that the League of Legends IP, they're doing this like strategic full court press, but if this company wants to grow beyond that, if you look at other companies that are IP companies like Disney or Blizzard uh, or, you know, uh, DC or, or any of those things, um, they have a range of things. They tend to have their big, they tend to have like this, like a fantasy property. Uh, so for Warner Brothers, that would be Lord of the Rings. Uh, for Disney, uh, that would probably be the princesses. Or um, in in Marvel world, you know, something to do with like Thor or you know uh, the other like more mythology based characters in that universe. Uh, with Blizzard, it's Warcraft. Uh, you need like a sci-fi thing. So for Warner Brothers, that's The Matrix, uh, or perhaps Dune. Uh, now um, for Disney, that's Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Wars. Uh, for Blizzard, that's Star StarCraft. Uh, you need a kind of a superhero IP. Uh, obviously, DC, Marvel. Uh, for Blizzard, it's kind of, I would say, Overwatch is their superhero IP. Um, and then the third one is like a Demons, like a Heaven and Hell kind of a thing that tends to be pretty popular. Those, those are like the four like tentpole IPs that I see. So I think eventually what Riot will do or should do or probably is like organically in their path to do uh, as they grow this particular IP, this League of Legends fantasy IP, is grow other IPs, a sci-fi one, superhero one, heaven and hell kind of a one and have those things be not directly connected uh, to League of Legends, completely separate uh, verticals for uh, IPs, and then you can have crossovers and integrations, you know, later strategic integrations. And I think you could target different markets, like more specifically, I don't think you need to start every single one of them as a game franchise. Uh, I think you can, you know, maintain the game franchise and then, you know, get into transmedia multimedia publishing and use the publishing tools and you, you guys don't know this but like riot games is also installing a bunch of people at netflix netflix has this games department they're hiring like aggressively out of riot games um so like stretch out these like publishing relationships um i think you could become like a pretty strong multimedia publisher just like uh like a disney or a um I was gonna say Warner Brothers or like Blizzard, but I, I think I think they have uh, potential to be stronger than those because it's like accepted as an American company, but it's a Chinese company. It's owned by Tencent, and so that also means they're not gonna get fucked with in China too much. Uh, so I yeah, they have a pretty strong position. I think they just got <laughs> this. Oh okay. Um, Yeah, interesting stuff. Anyway, Ruined King is a really good game. 
I'm going to reset my timer here again too. Alright, Ruined King is actually a really good game. I knew I was going to like it. I was playing Shin Megami Tensei 5 and I was getting a little bored to be honest with you. So I was like, ah, I wanna, I was, I'm going to play Ruined King next. I'll just start up right now and see if I, which one I like better. And it grabbed me. Uh, and it, it, the contrast is undeniable that I'm enjoying Ruined King a lot more than Shin Megami Tensei 5. Um, but I played the original game from that studio, Airship Syndicate, called Battle Chasers Night War. Uh, and it was actually like a very good indie RPG. It's, it's something that I think is a really interesting formula. Uh, because it is a, it's JRPG inspired, but it's also inspired by Western RPGs. And I'll give you, I'll tell you what I mean about that. Um, or I'll tell you what I mean by that. Like, okay, so it's, it's turn-based in a way that feels sort of Final Fantasy. Uh, but all the stat systems and gearing stuff and the art style is very um, in influenced by World of Warcraft. And um, the world and the set design is very, like, influenced by, uh, let's say, like, Pillars of Eternity or Baldur's Gate. Um, but also, like, Western comic books. It's, it's got, like, a real, like, comic book kind of, like, core to its art style. Uh, and then, but it's also got this, like, Japanese RPG influence, and it's, like, heavy. And it's, it's got, like, this anime influence, and it's heavy. Um, but it's still almost, like, it's a good fit for Riot Games, because it's, like, it's, like, 70% American, 30% Asian. Um... But it's, an, it's like a true RPG, not in the way that a lot of American RPGs are, where they're like apologetically RPGs, like they will be like an FPS RPG or like an action RPG. It can never just be like a fucking RPG, uh, but Airship Syndicate makes uh, good RPGs that are actually RPGs, like on purpose, and they have their own style to it, and it's very like, it's their style, but it's very like World of Warcraft, it's very like... Uh, old Squaresoft RPGs, it's very like um, Pillars of Eternity, uh, very like uh, you know, Shadowrun, uh, Dragonfall, Shadowrun Returns, um, and I like it a lot. I like Battle Chasers Night War, I like Ruin King. My main problems with it are two things, and these are kind of just um, constructive criticisms because I do like the game a lot. Uh, so, two things. I think the story is weak. I think the story is weak, and it's forgettable, and it's hackneyed, and you can kind of just skip the entire thing because it's so generic. You just kind of already know it because you've heard it a billion times. It's generic video game story. Uh, like, the arts, the scenes are really cool. So that saves the scenes, but like nothing, there's nothing happening in the story for this game that is like engaging or like fresh or like uh, surprising or like insightful or thought provoking or um, emotionally evocative or anything like that. It's it's very like video game story. It's like video game story sixty four could be it could have been made by an AI. Uh, not to like insult who wrote this thing, because it actually feels like they had some real writers on this. Um, but I just, the writing wasn't the problem. The problem is that the plot of the thing is a generic video game story. Um, just like, there's nothing like special about it. It was nobody's magnum opus. It was workmanlike. And, uh... Now I actually have three criticisms. The second one is you have to run everywhere, and I fucking hate it. I feel like the game is, feels twice as long as it actually is, because the fast travel options are very limited, and like your run speed is real slow, and so you have to like run from place to place. It's a real pain. It takes a long time, and you have to do it a lot. And um, 
that ties into the third thing, which is the game is too short. Um, it's kind of got that like indie game kind of length to it. So like scope wise, it works because they crisply created a self-contained package of a game. And I don't know if there's any like limited post game yet, but uh, it just it feels like I want more game than this. It feels like this game needs like um, the end of this game feels like it should be sixty percent of the way through the game. Like it needs sub just substantially more game uh, to feel like a complete full game experience. Like I, maybe like one more story dungeon before the final dungeon, like one more story area. Um, and then maybe like a, a kind of involved post-game dungeon. And then I think it would feel like a whole game. It just doesn't feel quite whole. So those are my three main criticisms of it. Um, as for praise, I think the art is very, very nice. Uh, I think that the characters they picked were great characters. I loved all of the party members. Um, I liked their gameplay mechanics. I thought their gameplay mechanics were really well designed and well conceived, although some skills are more useful than others. Uh, it's difficult when you have like five ways to where you're just doing damage to an enemy. Like if you just math it out, you just do the like the best way every time, right? Which is almost always the same way. Um, but I think Every character had a really interesting, you know, well-conceived gameplay kit. And I really enjoyed the upgrade systems. Uh, it has both, like, a rune system that augments your character with special abilities, and then ability points that you can use to upgrade specific abilities. I thought both of those things worked. Um, I think Battle Chasers, I liked the crafting a little bit better in Battle Chasers. Here, gear just didn't feel like special in quite the same way. And in Battle Chasers, at the end of the game, not only do this, you not only do you do this big hunt for the best weapons and the ingredients for them, uh, but it's also you find like the best armor and you can like upgrade it in special ways and you try and like gear out your guys to like the maximum level. Um, I also think hitting like level 30 is max level it could have been 40 it could have been 40 i don't think there's any real reason why it needed to cap out at 30 um and also the game on normal is like very easy like you normal would have been casual for battle chasers battle chasers was distinctly harder than this and that's probably one of the complaints that they got for battle chasers so they probably made it easier um, but you got used to the difficulty in Battle Chasers, so I think Battle Chasers actually had like a pretty good difficulty. But you could have made it a little easier. Uh, this feels a bit like an overcorrection to me. I'm gonna be here all night. I'm gonna get in depth. This is what I'm doing tonight. I don't care. All right, I'm back. I have to get a drink. <clears throat> Actually, I already drank most of it, so I'm probably gonna have to get up and get more drink. All right, so I'm playing Shin Megami Tensei Five, and um, it's kind of boring, bro. There are, I, I mean, I already knew that coming in because I played other Shin Megami Tensei games before, and uh, people are bristling online about having Shin Megami Tensei be compared to Persona. Uh, but of course I'm going to end up doing that, but let me just say from the beginning, uh, the reason it's boring is because it becomes repetitive and routine. So the way it works is um, you get to a new area and, okay, so Shin Megami Tensei is like a dungeon crawler, a dungeon crawler. It's like Etrian Odyssey or something like that. It's not like a hugely story focused game. Uh, it's more about expl exploration and upgrading. Um, I feel like RPGs, they're about story, exploration, uh, upgrading slash customization, and then turn-based combat system, or some similarly strategically minded 
chess derivative, D&D &D derivative kind of a combat system, whether that is actual combat or some sort of persuasion mechanic or, or something abstract like that. Uh, but this Shin Megami Tensei is more exploration focused, upgrading focused, and uh, maybe, maybe a little bit combat focused. Uh, the combat is more... Combat also becomes repetitive. And so what I mean by the game is repetitive is every time you go to a new area, you just like obs like uh, look around, you just explore it, uh, looking for you know treasure and these little like me man things that you collect, these little red guys. And uh, as you do that, you level up. Every time you level up, you unlock new monsters and you go upgrade all your monsters. Well, you just do that. That's the game play. That's the gameplay loop. You just do that on repeat, over and over and over, um, and you just constantly upgrading to new monsters, exploring areas that all like are vaguely similar, and um, there's not a lot of carrot to that amount of repetition. It's not like um, it would work if you know every third round of upgrading monsters you got like a really good one who's like especially good but no the monsters are all just kind of the same it's all it feels like a very linear upgrade path um and i think that's part of why the game feels boring because it just feels like you're doing this this like very slow steady climb toward the end of the game or maybe even just like a flat line the game is this exact same thing from the start of the game to the very end of the game. Like, instead of using, you know, Thunder 1 or, you know, Zio or Zio as they call it in this game, uh, you're using Thunder 3, uh, but you're still doing the same exact thing that you were doing when the game started. And um, there's nothing particularly interesting going on narrative-wise. Um, there's nothing, anything particularly going on upgrade wise nothing particularly interesting going on exploration wise so it's all just kind of very mundane however i do think that's also somewhat a strength of the game and it feels like a deliberate choice and it works in a different way and uh, what i'm gonna say is like i usually play two different kinds of games I have games that I play absent-mindedly, idly, while I like watch YouTube videos and listen to podcasts, like Dota Underlords. Um, you just like throw that on and just like play it. You don't really have to pay attention to it. There's a lot of downtime in it, so you can like all tab out of it. It's like very good for like ADHD multitasking, like a bunch of different stuff. Um, and then the other type of game that I play is like single player narrative story driven RPGs um, like Ruin King or Tales of Arise was the one I played before that um, I don't remember what I played before that actually I think I played like Final Fantasy 8 fairly recently I don't know I, I played some I think I oh Darkest Dungeon 2 I played that as well yeah, anyway, anyway, um, anyway, this is a single player story driven RPG, uh, but it fulfills the role of like the throw on a podcast, idly play this game, kind of like absent mindedly get through it because it's so slow paced, uh, but it's also somewhat relaxing. It's like, it's like, uh, what was that Genova Chin game? Like, there was Flower, right? But then there was uh, Journey. It's like Journey. I, I, I think the people who played this game played Journey. And it has kind of like this um, Zelda quality to it where there's like a whimsic, whimsy to it. So I do like the game. I think it's like a B, like a, like a solid B or a B minus. Uh, maybe like an 8 point. What would I give Shin Megami Tensei 5? Like an 8-2. B, low B. 
still a B, not quite a, not exactly a B minus, but like it could be a B minus, depending on how you're counting. Now, like, I'll give it like an eighty-one eight. Yeah, eighty-one point eight. That's the grade I think Shin Megami Tensei deserves. Uh, as far as Persona comparisons go, like you have to compare this game to Persona because it almost feels like it's the same IP. It feels like it's the same franchise because it reuses so many assets. Like all of the monsters are the same. Uh, like there's a great deal of crossover in terms of like the demons, and there's a great deal of crossover in terms of the gameplay. It's just a different game series. And I believe Shin Megami Tensei was actually the original one, and Persona is the spin-off of that uh, that just got bigger than it. Just like Oreos are bigger than Hydrox cookies, which was the original uh, version of Oreo I learned from the Food Theory YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so it's a very different game in that it's like a survival dungeon crawler. And it's this very slow-paced thing, and it's not a story experience. It's much more like Etrian Odyssey. It's very, like... It's a sub-genre of RPG. It's a little more niche. Um, and I think you would be hard-pressed to say that Persona is not better. <laughs> like, uh, because Persona, I mean, it's, it's, Persona's the flagpole. It's, it's the tip pole. It's the, it's the big, you know, award-winning, you know, it could, it, you could sell consoles with Persona. Um, not, not, you're not going to get the same crowd to show up for Shin Megami Tensei. Like, that's for sure. And uh, the plot for Persona is amazing in all of them. Basically all of them. You, when you consider like the time periods in which they came out. Like, Persona has always had a really good original story. Uh, Shin Megami Tensei always has not done that. And so, like, what does Shin Megami Tensei Five feel like? It feels like a, the next Shin Megami Tensei game. Uh, and Shin Megami Tensei, I don't know, it's all right. It's pretty good. Uh, but, you know, if you don't want to compare it to Persona, that's fine. Eight, eighty-one, eight. That's what I give Shin Megami Tensei Five. Uh, but I do like it. I do like it. And uh, I do kind of like the concept of you know, just throwing that on and listening to podcasts and playing it. and it's, it's like a hard candy. It's like a Jolly Rancher. It's like the Jolly Rancher of RPGs. It's like, you just just keep keep sucking on it. <laughs> just keep sucking on it. Okay. Next time. Okay, here's what it says for next topic. In Kanto, or in Kanto, I don't know. And Eternals should be on Disney Plus for free. Theaters are for special events now. Yeah, that's that's what I think. Like, um, I want to see both of those movies. Uh, I don't think they deserve me to, like, actually go to a specific location to see them. No, I, think, I don't think they're that kind of experience. Um... I would be willing to go see something that is like really an event uh, in a theater, like Dune. Although I did not see Dune in theaters, so I watched it on HBO Max. Well, I have a home theater here, so I could. I didn't even watch it on my home theater, like which is in the other room. That's why I'm gesturing over there, uh, which is like you know, not theater quality, but it's you know fucking huge. Um, I just watched it on regular TV because I didn't feel I didn't even feel like going up and walking in there. Uh, I probably should have though. It probably deserved it. I'll do it next time. The couch in there is not as comfortable. That's why. Which was a mistake on my part. It was a uh, interior decorating mistake. But the couch in there looks really nice. It's just not as comfortable as the couch out here. Anyway, um, yeah. So I want to see Encanto. And I want to see Eternals, but they don't deserve to be in theaters. They're just not good enough. Like, if you can watch The Boys on TV, which is, like, better than either of those things, I assume, 
uh, you should be able to watch those things on TV. Like, there are other ones, too. Like, um... Shang-Chi probably didn't deserve to be in theaters, although the timing for that was different. Mortal Kombat probably didn't deserve to be in theaters. Um, Free Guy. Well, no. I think those movies did deserve to be in theaters. But there's no way... Maybe I would have gone to see if Free Guy in a theater if I knew it was never going to come out video on demand but most things that are theater only are just I'm not going to see that <laughs> like it's just they've they've made the business decision that they don't want me to watch it or I'll watch it when it comes out you know on streaming I don't know what would make me go to a theater why do you want to make me go to a theater? That seems weird to me. Stop trying to make theaters survive. <laughs> like, I think, yeah, they're good for events. I think that as time goes on, just like the Darwinism of business will be that what is currently like your arc lights, uh, what is currently like your AMC or whatever, will have to find a, a niche in special events programming, special events planning, just like independent theaters did to survive when like theaters were more mainstream, like those independent theaters are going to die or be consolidated into like these other things. And then like theaters as a whole, I think are just like, it's going to be an event that you go to and they're going to have to focus on making it like an evening and making it like a date experience or making it like a group thing or a nice like solo thing to do like a welcoming environment uh yeah yeah make it give everyone like they'll be in the business of giving people a night out not the business of distributing movies that's what i mean by that and i think the sooner the better they start leaning into that because i am not going to watch eternals in the theater <laughs> like, i'm just not going to do it um, okay, so I'm also vibing with my life right now. It feels pretty good. I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot. I feel like I've hit my stride. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not like, I was going to say floundering around. What I mean is like, you know, I moved to Florida. That was a big life change for me. I didn't really bring anything or anybody with me. So I kind of just showed up here with nothing. And, uh, I think I just, I'm starting to get comfortable here. It's, I'm just, I feel like I'm starting to hit my stride and, uh, yeah, like I'm starting to feel like I have friends and stuff. I'm starting to feel like I know kind of like where my spots are. Like I have my footing. I've explored the city a bit. Um, like maybe some people know me and like, I'm, I'm more comfortable, like I'm being more productive and I just, it doesn't have that, like, uh, I don't know, the whole, the whole thing, it feels like homier, um, but it also feels like, like a good spot to be and like, I don't know, I'm just feeling good about things, like I, I'm writing this book. I feel good about the book. I feel good about the people I meet. I feel, feel good about the people I hang out with. Uh, I feel... Um, I don't know. I'm liking, I'm liking the games I'm playing. I'm liking that, you know, I make... That I'm running this website about games. I really enjoy doing that. I really enjoy having like time to write. I really enjoy... Florida, I just, uh, I really like the setup for my apartment, I like, you know, where I live right now, I even like, 
I post like crazy rants and shit on Facebook. I even like doing that. Everyone on there th probably thinks I'm insane. They, these are people they haven't met me in person. They don't know me or like how many online accounts I have. And it's, it's quite, it's so fucking funny to me. Like it's so, because I just say whatever on there. I just go on it. Because you could write essays on Facebook. And like the people there kind of don't matter. <laughs> like no, no one matters anymore. Uh, because, you know, just like the fucking internet, right? Like, but just, just for like some, uh, I don't know what the fuck you call it, some like comparison. Uh, like at some point I had like 600 something friends on Facebook uh, and I just started fucking deleting people because like I, Facebook doesn't want to be what I want Facebook to be, <laughs> it feels like. Uh, and uh, like at a certain point, like you just you don't fucking like know these people, and you're just like, why do I have you around, person I met for an hour seven years ago at a party, like that I barely remember attending, and uh, so yeah, I just started like just keeping that shit like real clean, and the people on there are still not people I know real well. They're mostly like acquaintances from like five to fifteen years ago. Uh, I don't think collectively they've spent more than a 24 hour period. Like all of, I have about 50 of them left. All of them combined, I don't think have spent more than a total of 24 hours in my like physical presence. So, <laughs> so like, uh, but it's, it's very funny to me. Um, cause like there, like I'll say things and it's like, it's so like shocking and appalling to people, but I'll say like, I'll go on Reddit and I'll type like a similar kind of an essay and that shit will get like a thousand upvotes or like, uh, so I have like 50 friends on Facebook. I have 230 or something on YouTube and I just do this. Like, uh, I have sort of like 700 on Twitter. Uh, I have a website that gets a lot of traffic, uh, where I also post essays and you know, stuff about my books and stuff. Um, and, uh, I have, I've made more friends in Florida in six months. I made an Instagram specifically for Florida just to like start over a new social media account to add everyone here. So I wasn't adding them to my insane rants Facebook account. Um, and I have more Inst or I have more Instagram followers in six months than I have Facebook friends. Uh, which should alarm Facebook. <laughs> like, here's what I would want from Facebook. I wish I could get followers and not friends on Facebook uh, because I'm not f fucking friends with most of these people. Like, um, most of these people, it's like, I want you to read what I wrote, but it's, it's like a, I'm on stage. And I, you, you, it's not a conversation between me and you. I'm not, I'm not posting some like six page essay to like, you know, spark, a, like fucking your views. I don't give, I don't fucking care. <laughs> like I'm just, I, I, I'm saying this, it's my Facebook page and like, like it or don't or unfollow me or follow me or whatever. This is just, this is what I'm saying. And the permissible responses are the same types of responses that are permissible at like a fucking comedy special or like a musical performance. Uh, applause or politely leave. Like <laughs> one or the other. But it's, it's not you get to also get up on stage and like join me there. That's the way I feel about Facebook. Anyway, vibing with my life right now it feels pretty good. And one of the reasons I'm vibing with my life uh, just my professional stuff is going well. My personal relationships are going well. Uh, obviously, you know, things could be better. There's one other thing you're supposed to be worrying about. I forget what it is. Um, but one of the reasons is because I really enjoy the Orlando bar scene. Like, it's a nice spot. I was thinking about this the other day. About how, like, all these movies always take place in, like, uh, New York or L.A., or, you know, London, or, you know, these uh, really specific kind of noteworthy uh, cities. And, um, but if you look back at, like, uh, you know, 
I think it was Hemingway or, or this, this generation of people who like made Paris famous basically by uh, becoming famous expatriates there or you look at expatriate communities in Japan and like you have these Tokyo creative people and they're all making YouTubes and stuff and there's just kind of like this expat community there and um, I don't know when you think about like Kevin Smith movies and the way it made New Jersey like a place or Stephen King made Maine a place like I think there's something really special about Orlando and like this Orlando downtown bar scene in specific is like such a fun thing to be a part of on like a you know regular basis because uh, it almost feels like it's like mall rats man like that movie because uh, it's just like you go out and you go to some bar and you just like start your bar hopping is what you do basically you just there's like a bunch of really cool bars here of all different kinds of themes uh, if you, you can go to like a Japanese bar, you can go to a country bar, you can go to a hip hop bar, you can go to a fucking club, uh, you can go to like a country bar that has a club in the back of it, you go speakeasy, you can go to Irish pub, uh, you can go to like an emo night, you can go to like a rock joint, and you can go like tank arrays for that, like, you can even go to like, um, like, uh, like, a um, place called Cocktails and Screams, it's like a, kind of like a horror theme kind of thing, and they have like emo night kind of stuff, and uh, yeah, just like a fuckload of cool bars here, so every, a lot of people go bar hopping, and uh, it's fun because you can just, you go out there, you hit a bar, and then you hit another bar, and like, usually you just run into people you know, and that's why I say it's like mall rats, it's like, you're not specifically, like, like sometimes you just like, hey dude, what are you up to right now, you want to come hang out? Uh, but you just go out there into the you know bar hopping circuit and uh, see who you hook into you know like see who's uh, who is also out that night you meet a lot of new people like the other night I was hanging out I just went to a bar okay I went to I went to a bar I met a guy I know uh, we came back here we watched some videos we smoked some weed he showed me like a really cool waterfall which is actually still on my TV right now. Uh, and then, you know, I was, I was, I was going to stay in, but then I talked to some other dude. He's like, nah, dude, like, it's only like 10 PM. Just, just come out. So I came out and then I went to another bar and, uh, I ran into someone else I knew there. So I was talking to her and then I was talking to her and her friend. And then there became like a whole circle of people, like seven people, like just like a little social group, like spontaneously emerged. Uh, ended up like hanging out with them for a couple hours and then everyone like started splintering off in their own thing uh, I went with a couple of people like this couple and then this girl who was cute who I was like You know kind of I was I don't know if I would say trying to hook up with but like you know see see what trying to trying to hang out with trying to trying to hang around with, You know in their group And so you know we were all having fun we went to we went across to like another bar slash club and then like it turned out that dude was like having drama with this girl. She was having an affair with her husband with this guy, but she was also like leaving him alone. He was getting all like seething and like butter. Anyway, it turned into like this whole fucking kind of interesting story to watch unfold and be a part of. Because uh, these were like not people I knew before. And uh, yeah, ended up going back with those two girls to her apartment. But then I found out on the way to her apartment that she had a boyfriend. So I was like, all right, mindset change. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna just hang out with these people and uh, I'm gonna be cool and uh, so went over there and then her boyfriend actually turned out to be one of like the chillest motherfuckers. Uh, we were talking about like Marvel comics and like Cowboy Bebop and stuff. And what's funny is like that I got that that's the dude whose Instagram I took at the end of the night. Not as it's like I was I was into his girlfriend initially. That was like my initial incentive to be hanging out with that group of people and it's like. But I wasn't like aggressively into her. I was just like, "You're really cute." She was just, she was really cute, and I was just like, "Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to like, you know." Um, I don't know. When the group splintered off, I'm like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with these people." You know, that's that's kind of how that went. And so when she was like, she has a boyfriend, I was like, "Oh, okay, you know, whatever." Like, completely in stride. Anyway, that dude turned out to be really cool in like a bros 
friendship kind of a way. So the night at that point ended up me and him had like a really engaging conversation. Well, well, his girlfriend and her girl, who was, <laughs> yeah, they, they they were best friends. She was the one who was like having an affair with this other guy, and it was like going south and becoming drama. Uh, so they ended up hanging out, and then I ended up hanging out with this dude, and then I hang out, I hang out with the, that crew until like five in the morning. Anyway, like uh, just a good night, just like meeting people, playing it by ear, um, just like having a good time, living a living a good life, and I feel like I'm vibing with everything, and I feel good about right now. I think the last time I felt really good like this was like uh, 2008, probably. So I feel like my life is in a really good place, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's nice. I do, okay, I think I have one last thing on this list. Yeah, there's one more thing, it's going to be real fast. I saw a video of a tour of where the uh, Google is doing their quantum computer experiments, and uh, Dude, that office looks fucking radical. Not because of the quantum computing stuff, which is also cool, uh, but because there's like art everywhere. It looks like the, it looks like a Tony Hawk stage. That's what I wrote. That was my prepared joke for this. I don't normally prepare jokes, but for this one, it's not even a good joke. But it, it does. It looks like a freaking Tony Hawk stage. It, like, it's gorgeous. You should Google or go on YouTube and look for uh, Google Quantum Computer Lab Tour. And you'll see what I'm talking about. It looks amazing in there. Alright. That's going to be it for tonight.